Hey guys, welcome back. I've got a very cool bass on the bench today. Almost bass royalty, you'd say. Uh, if you know the channel, you know I'm actually a bass player and I really love these old things. This is a 1978 Music Man Stingray. Unfortunately though, it's got a dead preamp and in this video, I'm gonna see if I can fix it. Now, a while back, I made a video with another early Stingray. Uh, that bass had a few electrical gremlins, and uh, even though the preamp itself was actually potted in that black epoxy compound, managed to kind of work around that and find some solutions and get that bass back up and running. This bass, however, I think has deeper problems with the circuit. When the owner bought it in, we went through a couple of basic checks um, just to make sure it wasn't something simple like a, a broken battery snap or a loose wire or just some obvious you know, dry solder joint or something like that. And I'm pretty sure there's actually some damage or some kind of problem with the actual circuit. In that last video, I mistakenly said that that base was a 78. Well, it was actually a 77, but this guy really is a 78. The owner tells me that it's probably from the late part of that year, late 78. And the nice thing about that is that by this time, they'd stopped putting that black potting compound on the circuit board. So I'm hopeful I can actually work out the problem, maybe change a few parts and keep it as original as possible, but get the, the base back on track. Okay, I've got um, a couple of wires already disconnected, both the uh, positive negative from, from the battery I've disconnected because I'll use my bench supply for testing. I've also disconnected the string earth because uh, it was just a really short wire and doesn't need to be there. Um, and uh, it means I can move this about more freely. This circuit was just more or less dangling there. And that's because these um, sort of little black pieces of, uh, well, I guess they were originally double-sided tape. This has gone rock hard and has no adhesion in it left at all. Um, and they were just, there was a couple of them just holding it to these treble and bass pots. Unfortunately, it's left a lot of black mess on those pots, which uh, I'm gonna have to try and clean that up somehow, but I'll come back to that. Now, the current resolution on my power supply only goes down to one milliamp, so I've got it running through my multimeter and the circuit is drawing some current. We're looking at, what's that, 16, 17 microamps. Doesn't sound quite right to me. This schematic that's kind of all over the internet um, says that this guy measured 44 microamps of current. And if memory serves, uh, the preamp in the 77 I worked on in that last video, I think was around 35 microamps. I mean, that slight difference is, you know, fair enough, I think, with uh, 1970s, you know, electronic parts, tolerances and stuff. But yeah, 17 doesn't sound quite right to me. Now, pin seven of this op amp is the positive supply. So that should be nine volts. And there it is. The next thing I want to check is pin three. And that's because it's connected to what's known as a virtual earth or the bias voltage or the reference voltage. And that's created by these two equal resistors, which form a voltage divider, one going to earth, one going to the positive voltage. And this is, I guess, the DC uh, voltage that the signal passes through the circuit on. And by rights, this should be on or very close to four and a half volts. So let me check pin three. Whoa. Oh yeah, so that's, oh, it's kind of around seven and a half volts, but it's kind of slowly dissipating through the meter, 7.3 volts. So there's clearly something wrong. Um, the cool thing about this circuit or this circuit board is that the IC is socketed. So I'm going to remove the IC and we'll do some more checks. Uh, 
So with the op amp removed, I can test those pins again. There's pin seven, nine volts. Here's pin three. Oh, okay, yeah, it's it's just the same. It's still, well, it's about seven and a half, 7.3. It's still well and truly higher than four and a half volts. So what that's telling me is that this voltage divider, or the two resistances that are part of this voltage divider are not equal. They're not equal anymore. It means this resistance is much smaller than this resistance because this bias voltage is actually closer to nine volts than it is zero volts. So if I remove the power, and since the op amp's removed, um, hopefully these two tantalum caps are still functioning as they should, and I can simply just test these two resistances with the multimeter. Okay, so from earth to pin three should be, oh wow, it's like 40, it's, it's about 50 meg. So that's way, way high. So let me try uh, between the um, positive to pin three. It's 2.3, 2.3. Yeah, so about 2.3 meg ohms. It is a 2.2 meg resistor, but that's uh, within spec again for these type of resistors. So clearly this resistor here, I think this guy on the top here is the one that's problematic. It may even just be a dry or cold solder joint or something like that. It is. It was soldered 40 years ago after all. I could just reflow those joints, but I think I'm just going to remove this resistor and replace it. So now I've replaced this bad resistor, I guess I should check this bias voltage again. There's our 9 volt on pin 7 and pin 3 is not 4.5 volts. It's it's only about 4.1 volts. So I think that has to do with the input impedance of my multimeter. Uh, these resistors are so large that uh, that is affecting the reading. So I think what I'll do is I'll switch probes and I'll test it from the top down. So just then I have my positive probe on three and the negative at earth. And I think the input impedance in parallel with this resistor being so high was actually drawing this down a little lower than four and a half volts. So what I'm going to do is actually put my positive lead on the positive and then my negative lead at pin three. And we should get the same voltage drop if these two resistors are functioning properly. So that's telling me that these uh, resistors are fine and that the voltage or well, the reference voltage will be very close to four and a half volts. So I think I'm going to put the op amp back in and we'll test those bias voltages again. So there's our, whoop, there's our nine volts. There's our pin three. Again, 4.1. Uh, pin six should also be at the bias voltage. It's the output of the op amp. And there we go again, four and a half, or very close. And the same with pin two, actually, that's the input of the op amp, the inverting input. And there we go. So I think I may have fixed it. There is one thing I want to check though. Okay, so I'm just going to test the current draw once again. It's only about 30 microamps. Seems a bit low to me. So there is another thing I should really test. So this resistor here from pin eight to earth, this 1.5 meg resistor is sort of a unique part of the LM4250. It actually is what's known as a programmable op amp back in the day. And this actually sets the current draw for the op amp. I noticed that the resistor on this little circuit board is actually an old school carbon comp resistor and these can drift a mile over time. So if I pull this op amp, it'll just be dangling and I could put my um, multimeter on that and test its resistance. All right, so with the op amp removed, pin eight to earth should be one and a half meg, but it's actually more like 1.8. So yeah, I think I'm gonna replace that resistor as well. It's clearly drifted a fair way from spec.
All right, so that's about 40 microamps. So that's looking a bit better. There's a couple more things I want to test though. So the last test I want to do is just check the input and output coupling caps and make sure there's no DC or very little DC across them. So here's pin six of the op amp and there is our bias voltage. That's the output of the op amp. And this little blue guy here is the output coupling cap and the other side of that is this black wire which goes to our volume pot. And yeah, we've got about 12 millivolts there. I think that's acceptable. So I'm gonna live with that. And the input coupling cap, well, here's the uh, hot wire from the pickup, which is this white guy. Uh, and again, on the other side of the input coupling cap, we've got the bias voltage at pin three. And then there, uh, zero. So I think the input and output coupling caps are fine. I think we're ready to test this guy. Woohoo! Let's check the volume control. Treble. Cool. And bass. working. Man, this is such a great sounding bass. I, uh, I would have put money on it being one of those tantalum caps, but there you go, it was just a uh, dodgy resistor. So it turned out to be pretty, pretty simple in the end. Once the preamp was all fixed up, I just had to clean up all of that black mess from the pots and acetone made short work of it. Next thing was to stick the preamp back down and I actually found some black high tack double-sided tape and I just used two or three layers of that at each end. I also took a minute to test the pickups resistance. It should only be 2K with these pickups. It does sound a bit low if you're not used to stingrays, but you have to remember that the two coils are hardwired in parallel and they're, well, they're wound to 4K. I also tweaked the earthing arrangement when I reinstalled it all. As much as I want to keep these old instruments original, well, to be honest, the original earthing arrangement was frankly a little bit haphazard. I did the same thing in the 77 in that last video as well. They have different wires wired to different pots and the jack and stuff. And the problem with that is that if ever one of those pots or the jack came a little bit loose from the metal control plate, then the circuit would probably cut out um, and you'd have issues that way. And the owner of this space does actually play gigs and write songs with his originals band and, and record and stuff. So I really want it to be as reliable as possible for him. So the way around that is to just gather up, uh, I think there's four earth wires and just twist them together and solder them straight to the sleeve connector on the jack. That way, if any of these ever came loose, it would make no difference. The circuit would just solder on. The other thing I did when I was uh, rewiring it was take the negative wire from the battery and actually wire it to the ring connector on the jack. And that's so that the battery is disconnected automatically when you unplug the base. Obviously that's gonna save the battery, but to be honest, this circuit draws such a tiny current that a modern battery is probably gonna last like a year or something anyway. With the other base, the 77 in the last video, I kind of assumed that it had been miswired, but since making that video, I've actually read a little more about these very early stingrays and apparently they came out of the factory wired that way. So <laughs> there you go. It seems hard to believe, but um, yeah, I guess with such a low current drain, they could get away with it. The other nice thing about wiring the battery that way is that it's much less likely that you can damage the preamp when you change the batteries. If you have a preamp like this that's wired to be on all the time and you go to change the battery and you accidentally push the battery against the snap the wrong way before you plug it in the right way well in that moment you have put a reverse polarity condition on the on the circuit and there's a chance you're going to damage it uh, those tantalum caps for example can be damaged pretty easily that way the op amp itself can be damaged fairly easily as well so having the base turned off when it's unplugged gives it a bit more protection against reverse polarity. The other thing you can do 
and I've done it in this space and I did it in the 77 and it's also been done in all of the modern stingrays that I've seen and that is add a diode I just used a like a 4148 silicon diode wired in line with the uh, positive side of the battery there is a slight voltage drop associated with that but in the context of this circuit and the signal from the pickup and how much boost this circuit makes and all the rest of it it makes no practical difference to the sound of the circuit but it will save it from damage if there was uh, that, that little mishap with the battery. Um, actually, there was one other thing I did. I went over this schematic that's, like I say, you can find online all over the place and uh, compared it in more detail to the exact circuit that's in this space. And there was, well, there was one major difference. Firstly, the output cap should be 10 mic, not one mic. Um, and then there was sort of two or three very minor differences that probably don't make that much difference in the scheme of things but for what it's worth I'll uh, edit this and put a copy up on my website if you're into that sort of stuff. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Please if you did like and subscribe and for the moment I'm going to say thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.